Hello and welcome to season three, episode 14 of Conservation Conversations with BirdLife South Africa, our 95th episode overall. I'm your host, Melissa Whitecross, coming to you live from a currently load shedding parkwood in Johannesburg, but thankfully we have an inverter to keep the show on the road. So don't worry, ladies and gents, Conservation Conversations will continue this evening. We'd like to remind all of you that all of our shows are recorded and available on YouTube, so if you do miss out because your lights go dark, you can always catch up later. And while you're there, please remember to click the subscribe button and help us grow the support for our channel. We've already achieved over 1.3 thousand subscribers, so a big thank you to all of you who have done that so far. Now tonight's show, we welcome back Dr. Doug Hairbottle, who previously gave us a phenomenal talk on the Makala National Park and its birds. Unfortunately, like many of us, Doug was struck with load shedding tonight, so he skillfully managed to record his talk about an hour before we went live and managed to get it to us so that the show could go on. He will also try and join us a little bit later for questions, but nevertheless, we welcome him back and we look forward to hearing about his citizen science exploits around the Heronry Map project. But now onto the main event. Dr. Doug Hairbottle is an avid birder, atlaser, quacker, and that's a coordinated water bird counts er for who, those of you who do not know the quack acronym. But he is also a talented wildlife photographer. Doug is based at the Sol Plache University and is the current director of the Risk and Sustainability Science Center, which is part of the Department of Science and Innovation and National Research Fund's Global Change Program. Doug also chairs the Harip Bird Club. For those of you who missed Doug's previous webinar on Makala, we are in for a real treat tonight. It is with great pleasure that I welcome Doug to the screen and back to Conservation Conversations. As I said, Doug has unfortunately had to pre-record his talk owing to the challenges with load shedding, but never fear because he has done a great job of it. Enjoy everyone, thanks for joining us. Uh, evening, Melissa, and th thank you very much um, for the opportunity to be a part of the um, conservation conversation uh, series once again. And uh, good evening to um, everybody that is on the platform tonight. Uh, as you can see by my title slide, I'll be um, talking about another one of my passions, and that's um, herons and uh, heronries. And I just wanted to, to actually just point out that uh, you can see by uh, my signature that I'm also part of the IUCN um, Heron Specialist Group, and I'm actually the Southern African representative um, on that group. So hopefully the title has grabbed everybody tonight, um, so we can move straight on into the presentation. And I'd like to begin with a quote uh, that was made by Roger Tory Peterson, uh, and he was a, a well-known ontologist and naturalist in North America. And in his foreword to the, the book, The Heron's Handbook, which was authored by James Hancock and James Cushland, uh, who are probably the two biggest heron gurus um, on the planet. Unfortunately, James Hancock is no longer with us. But Roger Tory um, Peterson made this comment. He said, right in the opening um, line of his forward that herons are amongst the most glamorous of all birds, giving grace and line to the watery landscape. And I, I just thought that was a, a very apt way in which to begin this particular presentation because I, um, I completely concur with uh, the way that he has described herons um, in that particular aspect. So just some information about the Odeids. Um, and this is the family name. Uh, I'm going to have a look at some um, aspects with regards to their classification and diversity. So we're looking at species that belong to this family uh, called the Odeidae, and there are basically four groups, um, the bitterns, the night herons, the tiger herons, and the day herons. And the day herons are the, the ones that we are most familiar with because they um, form um, or, or constitute the herons, the egrets, and the pond herons. So there are approximately 70 species worldwide and uh, 20, 
two of them occur in southern Africa, and this um, includes um, migrant and, and vagrant species. And yeah, I've just given um, uh, two examples of the snowy egret. Some of you may have been lucky enough to see that in Cape Town um, not too long ago, and the Madagascar pond heron um, is another um, fragrant to usually the eastern half of uh, South Africa. So we have one rare data species, uh, and that's the white-backed night heron, which is classified as vulnerable. Um, and again, if you've been lucky enough to see the species, uh, then um, it's, a, it's definitely a special tick um, on your list. Uh, other species that were sort of previously assessed in terms of red data assessments, the dwarf bitten, little bitten, um, and the Eurasian bitten, which is a special interest species. So there are three other species um, that are kind of on the, on, on the verge of being reassessed um, in terms of their red data status. Uh, the slaty egret is um, a globally threatened species. It's, a, it's, it's peripheral in terms of its range in, in Southern Africa, um, but during extremely wet years, and we've just um, had a, a very wet season, um, you know, these birds tend to move around quite a lot and um, can be uh, you know, picked up at, at uh, sort of large and natural wetlands. Um, and there's been numerous records this, um, this past um, summer or rainy season. Interestingly, there's no endemic or diet uh, to uh, the subcontinent, uh, or in fact, globally. So um, they are quite a cosmopolitan um, group of birds. Uh, the Goliath heron um, is a species that is needing a careful monitoring. Um, this is a species that I think we are all familiar with. Uh, and in terms of taxonomy, well, this is always being revised. And that's what I'm saying is um, you know, approximately 70 species. The little egret reef heron complex is an ongoing debate. Uh, are they a, a, um, a subspecies? Are they one species? Um, or um, are they a, a much sort of greater complex um, of, um, of, of, of two species? And uh, there's ongoing work happening with regards to these two species. Right, so these are large long-legged wading birds. Um, and in my book, unfortunately, the stints and the sandpipers um, should be called shorebirds. Um, and uh, the herons and the bitterns and, and, and this family are, um, are known as waders. Uh, and they're often seen with their beautiful plumes and, and, and other um, colorful parts of their plumage, and especially when breeding, and we're going to be getting onto that a little bit later. They're largely colonial. Uh, and. Uh, uh, we're going to also explore um, a large aspect um, of that part of uh, the bird's behavior, but sometimes they can be found solitary. And this is really a, a, a case of when they're feeding um, um, versus the, the time when they are obviously breeding. Uh, we've got terrestrial and we've got aquatic species, and, and this is um, uh, quite a interesting aspect in, in terms of species like the black-headed heron, which is a, a terrestrial species, often find them walking amongst uh, short grassland areas, um, trying to find rodents um, and uh, uh, etc. cattle egrets as well. Uh, but the interesting part is that they um, will breed at wetlands. And this is where the next part comes in, is that these species are all wetland dependent, um, at least when they breed. So black-headed herons, um, will um, breed in or, or near water, but they are terrestrial feeders. In terms of the global distribution, um, uh, you can see in orange the, um, how, how they are um, a very widespread um, group of birds. The gray areas are indicating areas where they um, are not found, and you can see that um, is confined to large parts of these larger deserts, such as the Sahara and the Arabian Peninsula, Parts of the Australian desert system, and then of course part of the sort of Arctic and and, and the Antarctic regions where they are not found. Um, so they found in both the old and the new world, and some of them have really restricted ranges. And yeah, just a nice um, portrait uh, slide showing some of the different species around the world, uh, and just to to show you such some of the marvelous um, uh, plumage characteristics and uh, colors that they have. Uh, and uh, the Indian pond heron, for example, and the Chinese pond heron um, are some of our smaller species, but uh, these incredible 
colors, especially during the breeding season. Um, but of course, we can't ignore uh, our own white-black night herons, goliath heron, our little egret uh, with the yellow feet, and the Eurasian bittern, which is a species that uh, is extremely challenging to see, confined to reed beds um, most often. Uh, but again, it's a, it's a special tick for most species. So let's just have a look at the, at the rundown of um, the, the red list um, of heron species, um, according to the IUCN red list. Um, and then you can see right at the top, we have one species, the white-bellied heron, uh, which is critically endangered. He has a, um, a image um, of the white-bellied heron. And here you can see this extremely restricted range um, of this um, species uh, within the um, parts of the, the Eastern Himalayan ranges. Uh, and according to the latest uh, information and the assessment is uh, sort of less than 250 individuals left in the wild. Then we have um, five species that are listed as endangered. Um, and we are familiar with the Madagascar pond heron and even the great white heron um, is listed as endangered. Um, four species listed as vulnerable. Uh, this includes uh, our slaty egret, uh, and then two species that are listed as near crescent. Um, and I've just included the Agami heron here, which is a vulnerable species, um, sort of confined to the northern parts of South America and Central America. And just look at those gorgeous colors of, of this heron. Um, but as a species that um, has been uh, extremely well studied because of its red list status. So what makes the Odeidae so fascinating? And the, and the clue to this question is in the photographs. So I'm sure you can't miss um, these extravagant plumes um, that these birds uh, have, um, especially when it comes to breeding time and, um, and, it, and, and courtship. So yeah, we have this extremely amazing picture of this great white egret um, with its dazzling plumes uh, um, during some courtship display. And over here, a yellow crowned a night heron pair and these are species that are restricted to the Americas. Um, see these, these, these head plumes um, and these are back plumes as well. These, and often species have these, have these neck plumes as well. So it's these plumes that, 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 that actually make um, the family um, unique to a large extent. And they have an interesting history. This is where I'd like to begin. So, so they've been a persecuted group uh, since the 19th and early part of the 20th century, persecuted for these plumes. Um, and these special ornamental plumes, like I, uh, I've, I've mentioned, um, are called uh, plumulaceous feathers, and it's because they are very soft and, and, and the barbs are, are spread very far apart. So they're not used um, for, for any other reason but um, for ornamental purposes and display purposes. And um, sort of back in the 19th and 20th century, there was a huge fashion craze amongst the, the European and also the American elite. Um, of having these fancy hat decorations. And, and it was termed this cruel fashion craze because these hat decorations um, constituted a lot of the plumes from these birds. Um, and so there was a lot of hunting that took place um, in order to, to fuel this, this plume trade that existed at the time. Um, and so the, this, this hunting um, of, of, of these birds for the plumes led to massive declines in populations um, over that um, or over that particular period, um, and then hunting bands were introduced in the earliest 20th century, and we're going to just um, have a look at that in a bit more detail. And so, here are these um, head dresses that um, a lot of these elite women used to wear um, during this time, and these were called aigrettes, um, and they large sort of, of white egret feathers or some other de you know, decoration linked to, to gems um, or even um, the bird's heads, as you can um, see in the bottom left-hand picture. Um, and it was the, the, the way in which these egrets these were, were put together, the, the way in which there was a demand um, by these um, you know, women that, that formed a part of um, the elite society that, that, that led to uh, the, this, this huge trade um, in egret feathers, in particular white egret feathers. Um, and so you can just see by these examples that I've um, shown here how, how often um, you know, these, these um, egrets were uh, you know, 
sort of put together um, and uh, just extravagant. And um, I guess at the end of the day, they did look beautiful, but um, at the same time, they were causing declines in um, our populations. And so just how bad was this trade? Well, uh, we can um, see that in 1902, auctions at the London Commercial Sales Room sold just over 1,600 packages of herons plumes. Um, and it, it, it took four herons to make up one ounce of plumes. And therefore, just by um, doing the calculations, one can see that the sales from this one source alone required 192,960 herons killed um, in order to obtain the plumes that were necessary for these millinery purposes, these um, businesses that were um, that 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 made um, these aigrettes for um, the um, elite women um, of of the period. And so, between 1870 and 1920, it's estimated, at least in the USA, that tens of millions of birds were slaughtered. About five million little egrets, it's been estimated, were slaughtered annually to to fuel this trade. The peak of the trade was the end of the 19th century, and it was bringing in approximately 20 million pounds per year. So it was um, a, a very busy trade indeed. And in 1914, um, actually, eagle plumes were worth up to 28 times the equivalent weight um, of silver. So the value placed um, on, on these plumes was extravagant um, to, to, to the degree that it outweighed the uh, equivalent weight um, of silver at the time. But of, of course, we can see how bad that the, this, this trade was when we look at the fact that adult birds were obviously slaughtered at breeding colonies because they only um, obtained these wonderful plumes during this time. And so the plumes were taken, the carcasses were left, and the chicks were also just left to die of starvation in their nests. Of course, when you're dealing with um, sort of the the economics um, around this particular industry, there's always going to be politics, and so um, it, it was this uh, Mrs. the Missouri Senator James Reed, uh, and he was a very strong politician, and he was criticizing this whole thing about uh, the, the Massachusetts Audubon Society um, we were planning this boycott. And it infuriated the hat makers who labeled them as extremists and sentimentalists. Well, I'm probably going to blame them. Um, but he complained and said, why should there be any sympathy or sentiment about a long-legged, long-beaked, long-necked bird that lives in swamps and eats a tadpole? So again, um, completely different mindset outlook with regards to the value placed um, on these birds and their feathers. But incredibly, it was um, two women who actually brought the end to the plume trade. Um, and then in the USA, it was a woman by the name of Harriet Hemingway, uh, was pictured on the right here, uh, together with her cousin, Amina Hall. Um, and they um, were fighting against the trade and forming boycotts, asking women not to be involved with this, and actually led to uh, um, the formation um, of the Massachusetts Audubon Society, which uh, was the beginning um, of the American Audubon Society. And then in the UK, um, similarly, Emily Williamson um, undertook similar ventures with regards to protesting against the plume trade. And in 1889, um, she also together with a large bunch um, of um, other women um, had meetings together with ornithologists and um, other um, prominent uh, men at the time. And uh, they, all their meetings eventually led um, to the formation of the, the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds. And so legislation banning this trade and of course the importation of these feathers came to light in 1918 in the USA and three years later um, in the UK in 1921. But, but linked to all this legislation that took place to ban the trade, there were lifestyle changes that also um, contributed towards the end of this plume trade. And when you think about it, the 1920s, there was the introduction of the automobile and uh, that was really a hat unfriendly uh, um, commodity. And, and uh, so it became very challenging um, to, to wear hats um, in, in these new automobiles. And then World War I um, led to sort of less attention being paid to, to fashion because there was a lot of families grieving. And, and so there was the, the switch to 
um, people wearing a lot more conservative um, thing. And, and, and the war had also cut off imports um, of, of all these luxury goods. And so ultimately, this led to a reassessment of, of the fashion at the time. So there were these um, sort of lifestyle changes that also made a contribution. But why do we look at the Ardeidi? Well, they obviously understudied, at least in South Africa. Um, and, you know, they, they um, that, you know, perhaps one or two species may be charismatic, but generally they're not. But of course, who, who cannot spend time admiring a Goliath Terran, or perhaps even um, a white backed night Terran um, stalking their riparian vegetation um, in the Bifuri? Um, breeding behavior is commonly noticed, uh, and that's usually um, at a, a time when, when, when people notice um, these um, groups of birds is, is, is when they're breeding because they are breeding in these large colonies, which we're gonna call heronies. Um, and, and, and they are really fascinating congregations um, of, of a whole bunch of different species. There's also environmental services uh, that uh, particularly species like the black-headed heron, and I suppose to some degree the cattle eager play in terms of pest control um, in taking out um, rodent populations, perhaps in areas um, where rodent numbers are high. So let's have a look at these heronies. Um, well, they're also called rookeries, um, uh, specifically in the, in the USA. Um, and, these, and these heronies are the breeding factories for these species. Now, this is where it all happens. Um, and these, you know, these heronies, these big breeding colonies, they, well, that, you know, they can be either small or they can be large, and this is often dependent on uh, the site that is selected um, by the species. Uh, they can be terrestrial, in other words, they can breed in large trees, specifically gum trees are, are used quite commonly, or they could be uh, 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 aquatic breeders in, in terms of breeding on trees on an island, um, or perhaps in reed beds. You know. And they could be discrete or they could be mixed. So, so there could be, for example, here in the bottom right, we have a picture of just cattle egrets um, within the colony and it's quite discrete, or they, could they, or they could be mixed, a whole, whole range of different um, species utilizing uh, the one site. And uh, uh, from my experience, um, a mixed seems to be a little bit more common um, than discrete colonies. So what, what benefits are there? Um, you know, there must be some benefits to this this colonial breeding adaptation that these, that these birds have. Um, and of course, we wish just make a note up front, there's obviously not restricted to this group. You know, we're looking at um, sea birds, um, to the turns of the gulls who also breed colonially and other species such as pelicans and storks. Importantly, these, these colonies act as information centers um, for the different species or perhaps across the different species. And, uh, um, these, the information that comes out of these colonies have um, anti-predator benefits. So you've got more individuals being on the lookout um, for predators and they can alert the birds um, in the colony to any particular aerial predator or any other predator um, that they are bound to um, come across um, during their, their breeding period. Then there's the food finding benefits. So there are gonna be individuals who perhaps know some um, really important or significant foraging sites. Um, and so in the morning when it's a time to leave the colony to go look for food, a lot of the times other birds will sit and observe and watch um, where the first birds fly to and then they will follow them um, hopefully to um, these, these rich foraging grounds. There's also breeding success benefits and this is also dependent on the size of the colony. They, they're often breeding simultaneously or synchronously. And uh, so there's um, a lot of commensalism um, traits that come out as a result of, of this. And so there, there could be really high breeding success um, just based on, um, on, on the fact that your neighbors are also successfully breeding um, based on the information that, that you as an individual are able to gather. And then of course, um, site fidelity is important. Coming back to breed at the same site, maybe even in the same trees, um, of course, if you come back and breed at the same trees, there's always a likelihood that those trees are going to die eventually. And they usually do after two or three years of use. There's a lot of guano deposition. Um, and of course, just the, 
the physical use um, of, of, of the trees. And so the birds will then have to rotate and find um, another site to use um, for a couple of years, giving the, 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 the original site um, time to recover. So those are all the, all the benefits, but at the same time, they can also be nuisance sites. And this is where we um, have this human wildlife conflict situation. Um, and, and a lot of time it's linked to urban or perhaps peri-urban heronies. Um, and uh, you know, there's um, lots of birds hanging around the colony, so they are noisy. Um, there's a really terrible odor um, that will, will come from there just due to the kind of food being brought to the, to the chicks and also from the guano that's um, been defecated. And so ultimately there could well be health issues that um, are related to the way in which these birds utilize these sites. And we're going to be just exploring one example about this because I think it's a very interesting aspect to um, these heronies. Um, and so another fascinating thing about the Ardeidae is their behavior. Um, and if you've ever had the time to sit and watch um, a heron or an egret, um, you will have noticed this. So it's mainly courtship related, um, but it's also linked um, to their feeding behavior. And, and the main reason for all these behaviors that one can document um, within the group, it's, it's there to maintain strong pair bonds. So during the breeding season, um, the, the, the pair bond needs to be maintained um, and all these fascinating behaviors um, are demonstrated or exhibited um, in order to maintain that pair bond during the breeding season. And they consist of both visual and acoustic signals. A lot of the time we see visual signals um, but there are um, audible or, or, or sounds that can also um, be made by um, the, the, the birds as, as, as these signals um, for, the, for the pair bond. Um, 17 courtship postures have been recorded, but more interestingly, 44 feeding postures or techniques have been described um, and they have been categorized in, into seven categories. And we're gonna just quickly run through these. I'm not gonna run through um, all of them, um, but if we look at the courtship behavior postures, um, there's your 17 and we've got things like stretch display, a snap display, a twitch shake, um, an arch neck, um, an aerial stretch or circle flights, all the way down to advertising calls. Um, and over here we have on the right an example of the stretch display. So all herons exhibit the, the, the stretch display. This is the primary display and it's used in the greeting ceremony also as a way to, to attract the mate. So here we have a, a male goliath heron that calls the bird sanctuary and uh, he's busy and he's busy um, doing the stretch display um, and looking for a potential mate. Here we have uh, some blue herons from North America um, who are um, involved in some bull clappering um, postures as a um, pair bond. And uh, there are, like I said, regular greeting ceremonies um, at the nest site. Um, and we're going to be looking at that shortly. So here yeah, is um, a video which I'd like to show you. Um, and this is all thanks to uh, Lynette Rudman. So um, sit back and uh, enjoy. There we go, there we've got the, the neck posture, the scar pointing that's taking place and the call. So the female is uh, around, perhaps coming into land. Uh, and this is the greeting ceremony that takes place. And now we have the male snapping his ball uh, together with the bow. So they have very harsh guttural sounds, um, these gray herons or the herons in, in the general. There are the female alights. You can see the plumes being erect uh, on the head and on the neck and on the back. Again, this is a way to uh, distinguish um, the, the partner. There's the male leaning forward, um, bowing before the female. And this is a way in which the bond is maintained and strengthened during the breeding period.
Right, and here we have a little short clip um, of courtship display. There's the stretch, also called the scar pointing. And you can see the yelp um, that, that has been made by the male bird. Okay, I'm just going to move on. Here we go, so it's just these wonderful elaborate displays that these birds um, are, are, are able to show to each other and of, of course to birders. And uh, um, it's just, just really exquisite and I would really encourage you that if you find a heronry and you find some um, some birds in, in courtship or at the nest just take some time sit and watch and you'll be amazed okay um, in terms of feeding behavior I'm not going to run through all of these but uh, just the categories in terms of the body posture wing movements body movements foot movements aerial foraging head and neck movements and there's a whole range of other um, which have, have been classified into um, a separate group, uh, and so it's 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 quite varied, and uh, you know there's there's a lot of of different postures and movements that have actually been identified when they are feeding. I think the one that we are most familiar with is our our black heron, which is um, a a canopy feeder, bringing the wings forward, um, shading the water, and attracting the fish um, to that particular area. Um, over here, there is a green backed heron. Um, that um, is um, doing a plunging while I'm um, sitting on a branch over a small river. And these are um, very common techniques used um, by these small heron species, um, such as the green heron. Okay, these are the kind of um, images that I think a lot of us are familiar with. Um, these sort of mixed heronries. Um, here is one on Robben Island. This is one um, in Kempton Park in Johannesburg. I think this one is near Plettenberg Bay, if I'm not mistaken. And this is somewhere in the Eastern Cape. Interestingly, we've got the gray herons. So this is a discrete colony using euphorbias um, as a site. And that's the first time that I have recorded or known about gray herons using euphorbias. So why do we focus on heronries? And this is a little bit of background for me. So it all started back in 2002. I got involved with a water bird ringing program within the Cape Town Metro. And uh, we were targeting um, the large colonies at Wonderflay Nature Reserve, because there was a lot of unanswered questions. Where do the young birds move to? Do they come back and breed at, at Wonderflay? So, so we um, started this, this water bird ringing um, program. And, and uh, so, so that got me excited about this whole thing and got me interested in, in heronries. And then I got reading about some of the work that has been carried out. And when you look at, at, at the Ardeidi sort of Globally, they're relatively well studied at the species level, but actually there's, there's, there's poor knowledge about, about the status of the heronries. Because um, the kind of questions going through my mind were, um, how often um, are they able to be successfully at the site? Does it depend on the site conditions? How big are the colonies? Um, and where do the young birds move to after they fledge? So there has been some work on um, the Odeid colonies uh, within Africa or South Africa, but it's been limited. And there's just a list of some of the publications um, that you can see. But ultimately, there's been no consolidation or perhaps a regional or continental approach that's been used. And, and so this got me thinking about we need to, to try and focus on collecting um, more of this, this information so that we can build a better picture on, on these heronries and, and, and how these species utilize these Heronries on an annual basis. And so in 2014, um, I, I launched Heronry Map Africa. Um, and this was a way that I saw that we were um, hoped to, to coordinate long term monitoring of these sites across the African continent in order to do certain things. That was to, to find out what is the status, the size, the composition, and the reproductive success um, at, at these sites. Um, to try and provide estimates of the size of the breeding populations um, for these colonial species, and that could contribute to um, publications such as the waterbird population estimates. 
um, have a look at providing site conservation measures, whether we need it, especially for conservation worthy um, species, or perhaps even, even sites that may be important. And then of course, try and have a look at these human wildlife impacts. Um, are there specific sites that, uh, that, that we need to have a look at and then implement appropriate interventions. And of course, ultimately to, to make a contribution to improving our understanding of the ecology of these breeding factories. I just love to call these things breeding factories because um, this is where it all happens for these species on an annual basis. Um, and especially in light of, of things like uh, climate change and landscape changes, how do these birds respond to these factors? And so it's a case of well, setting up a database so we can capture and store the data. And then I got um, involved with trying to promote the project to bird clubs and especially social media and set up a, a Facebook page called Heronie Map Africa. Um, and also just started having a look at some of the data coming in um, that I was able to, to, to glean from, from bird atlas data from various countries, access the nest record cards um, from the Old African Ontological Society and then, uh, and then the BirdLive um, um, South Africa scheme. Uh, look at the important bird areas program, information that was coming out of that, um, scan the literature, and then of course have um, uh, you know, speak to uh, some personal colleagues of mine um, who uh, have been working on these species or perhaps related species. So these, these networks, these professional networks would play a very important role in trying to garner as much information throughout Africa as possible. Of course, we can't really only stick to herons because we know that if we visit these sites, we're not only seeing um, species that form part of the Odaidi, but we're also seeing other species that um, come from other families. So we're looking at our ibises, uh, there's the, the glossy ibis, sacred ibis, um, looking at the, um, the, um, the cormorants, um, the phylicocoracidae, white-breasted and, and reed, and the, the, the adatus and ingidae, uh, having listed the family, um, and the thresciornidae, which includes um, the, the ibises, and the patellidae, also not listed, unfortunately, uh, which is the spoonbills. So, you, you, you're not only finding herons um, that are egrets that are going to be breeding um, in these large herons, um, and uh, they are often mixed with um, other species from uh, these um, families. And so this is just a, um, a first preliminary analysis that I did from uh, 2013 to 2016 and presented at a conference in the USA as part of the heron specialist group. And I, I don't really have the time to go into this in any detail, but there was a breakdown of the, the countries and the number of sites that we were able to document. And I think what the interesting aspect here is the number of um, sites that were not protected. Uh, so um, we're having a look at a high percentage of, of these sites that um, are, have, have no protection whatsoever, but yet they're playing such an important role. Um, and uh, this is just a preliminary sort of first estimate of about 25,000 prayers, uh, but there's a lot more um, data that um, has come in and this needs to be re-looked at. When we look at the spatial coverage, um, there we go. We've got Southern Africa, 238 sites, most of them coming from South Africa. There's a few sites in Madagascar, the East African sites, um, mostly from Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. There are some question marks in terms of um, information that's that's missing. Um, you what about um, Ethiopia uh, and Sudan? There must be sites there, there's some large wetlands. Nothing from Central Africa as yet, but I'm quite sure there are some sites. The same situation with West Africa, uh, it's really only um, Senegal and, uh, and Mauritania, Canary Islands um, and, and Mali that um, we have information for. So, so this is a first attempt really to to just have a look at the spatial coverage. And then the, the human conflict um, situation um, is, is, is quite interesting. So here we have uh, the, the kind of impact um, of uh, the sort of the, the human impact on, on these colonies from the cutting of trees to hunting, predation, removal of, of, of nests or trees, um, or uh, removal of trees and hunting, or perhaps unknown. So, um, there's um, definitely a lot happening within East Africa and the few sites within South Africa and Madagascar and even the West African sites where, where there's um, definitely could be the conflict that is taking place. Um, and so these are, are the interesting scenarios or the, 
or the fascinating sites in which um, further in investigation is required. And so I just want to take an example. This was from 2015, which happened at Port Elizabeth Airport of, of all places. And uh, just as you enter into the airport near the AXA offices, there were um, these um, trees in which um, um, cattle egrets uh, decided to, to nest. Um, and um, what was happening is that the, the adult birds were um, flying um, in a direction that, that uh, crossed the approach and, and, and offered the runway um, of the airport. So, so actually decided that the, that action needed to be taken and they, they just went and they placed these huge nets um, over, over the breeding colonies. And um, there was a large outcry as a result of that. Yeah, you can see the youngsters trapped the adult bird on, on top of the net um, trying to get in. And so there was a huge vo volunteer reaction um, to these calls to come and help. Um, and they um, cut the net open uh, and um, got, got all the young birds, even eggs and small chicks from the, the, the nest and they were rehabilitated. Um, there were obviously more mortalities, um, and which was unfortunate, uh, but it's these kind of actions, um, um, unfortunately, which, which lead to these conflict situations um, and they need to be um, handled in, in a sort of a lot more um, uh, conducive way um, that, that will aid conservation or perhaps education and awareness of, of, of these colonies. Um, even at the Grahamstown airfield, um, there, there were birds breeding in these, in these, um, in these large eucalypts, uh, uh, but, but they were removed because they were looking for water. There was also hunting taking place. Um, there was a National Heritage Society board, which I was not aware of, um, which helped to raise awareness about the importance of um, this particular site for um, the black-headed heron and, and the, and the grey heron. So as a result of this, um, together with um, Hanneline Smith and Albert Froneman um, from BirdLife South Africa and AXA respectively, we put together a document, um, National Guidelines for Interventions that Relate to Colonial Breeding Water Birds Causing Human Wildlife Conflict in South Africa. And this is just really a way that's aimed at landowners or other management authorities to, to um, you know, have, have some guidelines available about how to, how to deal with the intervention. So I found a site uh, I'm finding that the site could be a problem and what do I need to do? And, and this was important because we felt that um, as, as we go forward, more and more of these sites are going um, to be found or located. And so they need to be proper and effective management interventions um, so that things are done in the right way. And perhaps there might be um, opportunities to, to, to save a lot of the birds um, in these situations. So in summary, we had this first preliminary results. Um, what was apparent was there were these human wildlife conflict situations. There was a large proportion of unprotected sites, a lot of unknowns. We know nothing about the site, just a, a record of how many, how many birds and perhaps it's uh, this particular species of tree. But it again highlighted the power of citizen science and social media um, and uh, you know, more and more people taking photos, uploading information. But, but this needs to be translated into, into actual good data that can be used for this particular project. And so there's still lots of work to be done. Um, and so I would, I would really like to take this opportunity to say, please get involved as a concerned citizen scientist. I know a lot of you are already taking part in a number of projects, the Bird Atlas project and a, and a whole range of other causes, but there is this need for more data, and to, you know, looking at, 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 at more sites and looking at nest densities and especially the, the breeding productivity. So there's our Facebook uploads and of course my, my email contact to which you can send um, information. But I would really try to encourage a lot of people now to use the, the bird lesser course. So if you're going to bird lesser under courses, um, I have arranged um, with the bird lesser team to have an, a heavenly map Africa course. And so every time that you um, confront a, um, a, a species of a diet or cormorant or spoonbill, um, there's opportunity to add extra information. But what I would like to stress is that this, whenever you come across a heronry, that is a time where the additional information is required. So you don't need to add additional information every time um, you uh, record a heron or a spoonbill or cormorant, but specifically when you come across a active heronry, that is the time when this additional information is going to become crucial for the project. And I strongly encourage you, please, to um, to, to add this 
calls to your your bird lesser app and 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 please take part especially as breeding season is coming up especially they, they start in the winter rainfall region um in the, in the western cape in um you know sort of june july the, the herons and then of course in the summer rainfall um, as the year and the seasons progress okay so this is just a, a, a plea to to please um help the project become involved if you can so the future is about filling the gaps it's um especially for our, our threatened species or species that have special conservation concern and also perhaps it's going to help us um, identify sites um, or perhaps help us document areas where there might be environmental contaminants and this is um or can be you know become quite an issue hank bowman from northwest university has spent a lot of time looking at this um uh, with regards to herons and other colonial breeders um, so again it's not just the information about the site but it may become important and may become significant um, from an environmental contaminant um, perspective and 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 where we have these sites with no protection maybe we should start having a look at ways to protect them um, and uh, perhaps the stewardship programs may just be one way in which to do this initially um, there may not always be formal protective measures that are available, but stewardship programs, I, I believe, can play a huge role in, in just protecting these, these important sites. And then the implementation of the guidelines um, that we've produced um, for these human wildlife conflicts at the national, regional, and even the continent, the, the continent-wide level. Um, so we have this guide, but now um, as, as much as it's on the websites and things, well, perhaps there just needs to be a little bit more application uh, with regards to its implementation. And then there's a strong and urgent need for project coordination. So this is a project I've been running um, in amongst all the, the other um, commitments that I have with, with, with my job at the university. And so it's, you know, let's try and, uh, well, one of my aims is to try and find some funding so we can look at identifying a project coordinator, improve the data management processes, and, and then also link to, to, to things like um, the, the international, the Wetlands International um, pr proposal, which is on the right hand side here about um, the monitoring of colonial water birds. So it's um, a, a really significant project that's been identified at, at, at international level. And um, the big dream is, well, let's see if we can find some funding for a proposal to look at de developing an atlas of African heronies. I think now, now wouldn't you know, that be uh, an exciting project. So to end off, then um, let's let's look at at ways that we can um, conserve our herons and our and our heron reserve. I've I've introduced you to the persecution aspect, which um, took place um, at the, the the end of the 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 nineteenth century, beginning of the twentieth century, um, and uh, the the the. The whole decline in in these ordained populations because of the trade um, in these beautiful plumes that these that these birds have, and then through that legislation everything changed. Um, and, and thanks to one these all these wonderful NGOs, these birding organisations, including BirdLife South Africa, um, you know uh, that you know, can start looking at, at ways in which to to protect these these wonderful sites that you know you you come across. Um, you know, during particular times of the year, especially the rainfall seasons, you know, they, they're obviously linked to, to, the, to the rainfall seasons in the different regions. Um, and it's just to sit down and experience watching um, these birds coming in and doing their courtship displays um, and uh, just watching them, how they, how they feed their chicks and take turns in, in doing this. We can learn so much um, by, by just sitting and, and watching. Um, so, it's, it's really up to us um, in terms of promoting um, and making more people aware of the wonders of these heronries, the wonders of these breeding factories, um, and, but also at the same time to collect this important information um, that we can use going forward um, as a way to conserve these sites and to conserve um, these breeding factories. And so just a reminder, there's the Facebook page, um, there is the specific um, um, email address to which you can send information the, the, where the colony is located, um, the size of the colony, the, the different species that are, are using it. Um, and uh, if, if you do come across a colony, please 
um, I would really encourage you to, to send this information through to me um, via um, these two options that are on screen at the moment. So thank you very much. I hope that you have um, been able to experience um, and, and enjoy the, 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 the way in which these, these herons and these other species are, are, are able to be so inspirational um, to us as birders. Um, and we just like to encourage you to um, spend some time um, at, these, at these wonderful breeding factory sites. So thanks again to BirdLife for this opportunity this evening. I really do appreciate it. Um, and if there are any questions um, from, from anybody, I will um, be available to take them. Thank you. Sure, that was absolutely fascinating to think that these marvelous birds were pretty much the start of modern day bird conservation. Um, thank you, Doug, that really was phenomenal. I see we're not quite at eight o'clock yet, and I know Doug's power is only coming on after eight, um, but while we are waiting, I will try and answer one or two of your questions, and we'll see if we can, can drag this out a little bit longer, just so that Doug is able to join us. Um, if we get past eight o'clock and Doug is not able to, to make it onto the show, what I will do is those of you who have posted questions, I will email these to him with your contacts, and I'm sure he will be more than happy to reach out to all of you. But there are a few here which we can um, sort of answer. So Joseph, thanks for tuning in all the way from Rwanda. I would suspect the reason that Rwanda does not have any data is because these sightings have not been reported to Doug and the IUCN Heronry Specialist Group. So please, if you are there and you have data to share, drop Doug an email. We are always looking to plug the gaps on all of our birds and species of conservation concern. So that would be a fantastic step forward if you are able to contribute. And you would have seen Doug's Heronry guidelines, which he produced with BirdLife South Africa. Those are available on our website under the media and resources tab. So you can head on over to BirdLife South Africa and Google the uh, guidelines for heronry and water birds, and you should be able to find them up there. But it certainly has been great. Thank you to everyone who's popped their comments into the chat feed here. I see uh, lots of them coming through, which is brilliant. Um, a big thank you to Doug so much for this inspiring talk. I have to agree. And those of you who use the Bird Lasso app, it is an absolutely invaluable tool for all of us. Um, it certainly has revolutionized our conservation work at BirdLife South Africa, and it continues to be used by our partners across the country and around the world to log the locations of species. If you're out walking or driving or birding, and you happen to see particularly species of conservation concern, please go and like those threatened species causes. There's one for BirdLife South Africa, like the Heronry Map cause, and get that data fed through to BirdLife South Africa. It's one way of contributing to conservation. So I would certainly encourage everybody to download that app. It's also a nice, easy way to keep track of your life lists. And that is certainly great. All right, I'm just having a quick buzz through these questions to see if there are any others that I can potentially chip in on. Um, we've still got about two minutes to go. I'm gonna quickly pull up our closing slideshow so that we can share that with all of you. Um, just a reminder that we've got lots of good events and things happening, um, but most importantly, next week, Andrew DeBlock is going to be back with us. Um, he's going to actually be presenting next week on the Go Birding platform. For those of you who don't know what the Go Birding platform is, it is a hub for anything birds and bird watching in South Africa, from guides to birding spots to birder friendly accommodation and bird life recommended establishments. It is going to be the place to be if you are a birder in Southern Africa. All right, I see we still got two minutes to go till eight o'clock. Um, I know everybody's got lots to do, so I don't want to waste anybody's time. But um, what I will do is I will email Doug all of these questions. I'll leave the Zoom room open for a couple more minutes with some music so that you can pop your questions into the chat box. And I will make sure that these reach Doug and he can fill you in on any questions that you may have for him. That really was a fascinating talk. 
wonderful to learn so much about this fast, very, very interesting group of birds. And I certainly learned a hell of a lot this evening. So thank you, Doug, in your absence. I hope that your lights come back on soon. And we will see you back here next week, same time, same place. Join us on Conservation Conversations at seven o'clock. Happy birding, everybody, and keep your eyes on the skies and keep enjoying those birds. We'll see you soon.